This is Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Adrian Buskey. I'm joined in this episode by author Tade Thompson. We'll be talking about his award-winning science fiction novel, Rosewater, published by Orbit Books. It's the first in a near-future trilogy set in Nigeria that chronicles a unique kind of alien invasion. The follow-up, Rosewater Insurrection, arrives in 2019. Tade, welcome to Fictitious. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here. Well, and you're joining me from somewhere across the pond. Where are you at over in the UK? I'm on the south coast of England. You mentioned before we got started that you're on like the the end of a chain, uh, you know, like the farthest like reach of like your Wi-Fi. This is barely dial up. It's it's like I don't know if you remember dial up, but it's barely dial. I mean, from where I'm sitting, I can see France. So it's it's that far away from the main exchange. Well, I, you know, I think that's that's a fair trade off to be a like like oh my internet's kind of crap, but I can see France from from my you know my backyard, so that's better from my like I can see the YMCA from my yard, so I think your view is kind of better. <laughs> I just finished reading Rosewater, and I, I really really enjoyed it. Um, I think it's one of the more challenging science fiction novels that I've read in a while. It certainly has a unique premise, and and it's really refreshing to see a story that takes place in Nigeria. Can you tell me like what the story of Rosewater is about? Uh, the story of Rosewater is about a very, very, very slow alien invasion um, that is told from the perspective of someone who is affected by the invasion but doesn't actually know it. And we follow this person through the book looking through his abilities and finally realizing why those abilities exist. So the problems of those abilities, the benefits of those abilities, and the consequences of those abilities, all of them are kind of outlined as we go along. They, they slowly unspool as we go along. And that's, that's essentially what Rosewater is. I found Caro, the, uh, the protagonist of the story, to be a really uh, interesting POV character because He's not a hero. He's not a fighter. He's certainly special and and um and has a, a very unique skill set that's directly related to the alien invasion. But he's oftentimes not sympathetic. He's oftentimes kind of a crass jerk, and uh, and he seems pretty aware of all that as well. When you're putting him together, I mean, how do you approach writing a character that just like verges on? the edge of unlikability, but yet is so like self-realized that like he can be endearing to the audience. How do you put that together? So the thing about Cairo is this, there's some metafictional things about Cairo. That's why he does these horrible things and thinks these horrible things, but seems sympathetic. Cairo is actually us. Cairo is the reader. Okay. So Cairo is telepathic, but the reader is also telepathic because you can read Cairo's thoughts. That's why it had to be in first person. One of the points I'm trying to make with Caro is that nobody can be sympathetic if you can read their thoughts. Nobody. So if you or me or anybody that you know happened to tell you every single thing they thought for maybe 24 hours, you would not like them. <laughs> right? And, and that's, that's kind of what I was trying to, you know, that's, that's the metatextual thing there. Like, look. Yes, this guy is telepathic, but the reader is telepathic for Caro. Caro is telepathic for everybody else, but the reader is telepathic for Caro. And they don't like a lot of the things that he thinks about, and, you know, a lot of the things that we would normally censor. We don't like it. All right. But then we sort of at least subconsciously recognize that. Hang on. Well, sometimes I might think those things myself. Therefore, this guy is like me, but not like me. Therefore, I can cut him a little bit of slack, just enough slack not to hate him. So even when he's doing things that are reprehensible, we still kind of cut him a little bit of slack because, hey, this guy is me. Or you can read his reasoning for it. So it becomes a bit more understandable, if not sympathetic, but just at least understandable. So in Rosewater, you have a set of people that are essentially like somewhere in between telepaths and empaths and, and sensitives and they've come to forefront uh you know over like 50 or so years to become recognized as an actual legitimate real scientific phenomenon and this character is one of those people um and yeah i did have that thought where like i was like oh you know if we look at telepaths and other works like say like a professor x out of x-men you have this like incredibly 
warm, sympathetic guy who is looking out for humanity. And I often think, oh, if you could dive into everybody's thoughts and exactly what you said and see them from the inside, you'd be like, oh, oh, gosh, I hate everybody. We're all terrible <laughs> on the inside. And yeah, I, and I think that, yeah, there's a lot of moments where um, where your your character sees the world in a way that's, you know, he's he's catching kind of the gross complexities of what it means to be a human um, and is managing to still go through his day as a functional human, but one that's a little bit, I don't know, there's a certain part of his own humanity that's been ground out by his experiences. Yes, definitely. When you start putting this together, I mean, the, the nature of this world, like you said, it's like a very slow invasion. You have an, an alien creature that has landed on this world and, you know, is, you know, kind of wiped out London and then reappears in Nigeria sometime later. It, and it's not like the traditional, like, you know, big eyed gray aliens or super invaders or something. It's more of like a gigantic physical presence um, that has some other properties attached to it. Where did the ideas for this stuff in Rosewater come from? Like, what was the genesis for you? And like, how was it evolving over time as you were putting this together? I mean, just like anybody else, all of my influences from childhood, the novels, the TV shows, the movies of my childhood, all of that kind of came together. But specifically where this started, there were two, there were two major ideas where it started. So one was the idea that Sometime in 2010, there was a set of uh, co-joined twins who could hear each other's thoughts. And what happened is that they had a connection across one brain to the other. And they could hear each other's thoughts through that connection and see actually whatever the other one saw. Oh, wow. So I kind of kept thinking about that. Um, I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. And I, I, I said, OK, you know, throughout the 70s, all right, before the whole idea of telepathy was debunked, you had people like Yuri Geller, you had Russell Targ, you had remote viewing. I spent a lot of time looking at declassified documents from the CIA, the tests they did on telepathy and all of that, KGB files, things like that. I'd always been obsessed with those things. But I never had, you know, to put that in a narrative, I never had a plausible mechanism for telepathy until I read the story about the Kojoin twins. So reading that made me realize that, okay, so if there was an actual connection across brains then you could possibly do that so then it became okay but it would have to be really really small so that people can't see it and it has to be in the atmosphere somewhere so that everybody is connected to it and then slowly i then say okay so why would it exist why would there be that connection why would it be in the atmosphere what purpose could it possibly serve and then of course you know that meme with the guy with the fizzy hair that says it was aliens so in my head it then became okay well actually yeah it was aliens <laughs> you know and so the question then became, OK, well, why would aliens do that? What would they what would the purpose be? And with, you know, with asking myself these questions, subsequently, the answers led to the entire narrative. That's that's really how that's how it came about. You know, so it's 1970s conspiracy theory, CIA documents, um, part of the Day of the Triffids as well. You know, some parts of that, you know, the idea that or, or, or invasion of the body snatchers, you know, the idea that something could be sent here in pods that you won't notice in vegetative pods, you know, that you won't notice until it's too late. You know, that whole idea, I've always liked that. And I, I've always thought that, okay, if aliens did come here and if they are indeed smarter than we are, then they're not going to announce themselves with a gigantic mothership. There's no need to do that. They will just slowly and subtly do it. And that was, that was my, that was the genesis of it really. I had the thought I was just going through it, like in, in Rosewater, um, it's sort of a post-internet era where there's this new kind of, of online thing called Nimbus. But um, what Wormwood, who is the alien in question here, um, has kind of introduced, so it seems like inadvertently to the world, is almost like an internet of minds. You know, you were talking about it, it's like what makes that connection yes. and right down to the fact that like just like the connections that we have with the Internet, but it's it's not always consistent. It's sometimes it's faulty. There are ways to create firewalls. There are darker sections than others and and, you know, th you know, parts that are problematic and, and blocked off and things. And and so I thought that was like a really interesting way to take a, a almost like kind of a cyberpunky idea of that connection of mind. But instead of having it be this piece of of human technology, instead, this sort of offshoot offcast of that. And I thought that idea was really fascinating. Yeah. And that that comes from a very specific part of my background as well. So um 
way back in the midst of time, I used to be a um, Cisco network engineer. I used to, I, I have qualifications up to the CCNP, which is Cisco Certified Network Professional. Um, I used to do that in the early 2000s and everything. So things to do with the internet networking, even the early Wi-Fi, I trained to do all of that stuff just after after Wi-Fi was declassified by the um, by the U.S. military. Before it became publicly available, you know, we actually got access to that and played with it a little bit and because we would we would have to support it when people started using it, it started failing. So all of that informed how I built up that the Xenosphere, the place where this internet networking happens. All of that, all that training informs that, even down to the um, the idea that okay, even when nobody is transmitting, the network still sends keeper lives to make sure the connection is still working. That kind of thing. Um, so all of that was informed by my my um, networking experience. You've already got this complex idea at the basis of of what the essentially the power uh, you know that makes this this main character really interesting. But you also have a I try to figure out how to, how to phrase this quite right, because like the narrative structure of Rosewater is linear in the sense that there is a present timeline that we're following all the way through, but it is punctuated by flashback sequences that are not linear, that happen at different points, um, where you're essentially filling out parts of the story, revealing them slowly as we need them to understand the character in his world. And I think that makes for a really interesting brain challenge in order to like to work around those different things and to figure out like what is this showing me now how does this work but that can definitely be difficult for some readers and i imagine a really difficult challenge for you in writing it as far as figuring out how to put that all together so what was your like outlining process you know what like how did you put this together how did you keep track of all those different elements across that varied timeline so the first thing is i'll first of all talk about the readers i mean yes it would be challenging but i have i have in my head an idea about readers. My idea is that readers are smart. Readers are not stupid. Um, and I have to tell you, it's an argument I have with my editor all the time. You know, my editor <laughs> would be like, well, you have to explain this. I said, no, the reader is not stupid. They can understand it. I, I'm like, look, all the clues are there. The reader will understand it. These are not, you know, it's they're not toddlers. They're adults reading a book. They can pick up the cues. And my editor was like, no, 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 you have to explain this. Or you have to... Just revise it again, and that's usually the tug of war I'm, ha I'm having, but I write for the readers who I know are smart. People who pick up books are smart. People who read are smart. And what I found, at least, you know, leaving my own experience aside, what I found is that if you make a book challenging, as long as a reader can trust you in the first few chapters, they're willing to follow you if you can make them trust you in the first few chapters. So they will follow you. And so they're smart. They'll follow me. So I, I had no fear that people would not understand it. I had a little bit of fear that they might get bored. You know? <laughs> that was one of the things because I don't want I don't want my obsessions to be something that people don't enjoy as much as I do. But um, I didn't think they wouldn't understand it because I, I, I start my starting point is always that the reader is smart. That is always my starting point. The second thing is about constructing it. Now, one of the reasons, again, there's a metatextual reason for that. So. Older Caro is a miserable bastard, okay? You know, his life force is depleted and he's just basically just holding on, but he doesn't believe in anything anymore. There's lots of nihilistic aspects to his personality. And I realized that if I just told a story about this guy, it would turn readers away because I just realized that we need to know why he's like that, one. And two, we need something a little bit less than, oh, life is hell, people are rubbish, and I'm just going to exist here, and I'm trapped in this life, so I'm just going to exist here. So I realized people need a little bit more than that. And I also realized the problems of writing a first-person narrative is that you stay in one person's head. So one way of having a second character is having the same character, but when he was very young. That way, you know, he's young, he's foolish, he believes things that he no longer believes later. It's just like a second character. So it was a way of sneaking in a second main character, but not. You see, so it's young him and it's older him and the two of them are interacting and I made their stories kind of dovetail a little bit. So something that happens in the present will have an echo in the past and so on. And I wrote that all the way to the end. I wrote it all the way to the end in that way. And the young Caro's life has a resolution and so does the older one. That's how I perceived it. In terms of how I wrote it, I mean, look, the drafts of this thing were insane. I mean, I, I had to lose... I, I lost about 50,000 words by which I discarded it. I wrote it from a different point of view to start with. And then I deleted that because I realized it wasn't working. So I had to backtrack and start again from the beginning. 
I don't outline very thoroughly. I, I tend to hold stories in my head. Like I had the entire story for the entire trilogy in my head. What I do is that I, I, I write something out and then I begin to revise. And that's how I begin to remove inconsistencies and the like. But it was already in my head pretty much complete to the end of book three. So because I knew where it was going and where, you know, and where I was coming from, um, I initially started, like I said, I initially started it in a linear way and I realized it didn't actually work because you don't want to stay with a miserable person for 400 pages. That just, you just don't want to do that. I just, it just doesn't work, you know? Um, so I said, okay, I need to inject some youth into this. And that's how I then went back and said, okay, I'm going to just, initially I didn't even start like um, alternating chapters. I started like, I'd have like one or two chapters and then I'd go back to the past. But then I realized that no, I should actually alternate the whole thing. And that kind of worked better. It was a more interesting book. It was, and one of the things that I made it less boring, it made people pay attention because they realized that, okay, if you don't pay attention, you might miss something. And the, the things from the past had meaning in the future as well. So if you miss out bits or you stop paying attention, then you might not understand something that's going on in the present. And so that was that was pretty much how I do it. I like to draw diagrams. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm visually minded. I like to draw diagrams. I sketch things. I draw, sometimes I draw flow charts to make sure that the logic works. Mm -hmm. So I draw a lot of flow charts. I've got a lot of research notes about biology and networking and all those things I told you about the CIA files and everything and some espionage stuff and all of that. You know, my method really is to keep them in my head for the time. I just keep, I keep the whole thing in my head. And then I can just scribble it out when I'm revising just to make sure there's consistency. And that, so that's, that's what I do. You also have, I think, in, at least for like Western sci-fi readers, a unique setting with it being in Nigeria. And that, that colors everything about the way everybody talks, the way, you know, how people interact. And there's a lot to learn about the social customs, uh, you know, inherent in that area. When you were making the that, that choice with it and working towards that, like, how heavy was that for you for research? Did you need sensitivity readers? Did you like, how did you work towards all that? Oh, hell no. Sensitivity. Nah, 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 nah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, lived, I lived there for decades. I speak the language. It's my background. Um, it's not, I didn't need anybody to, to read it over or anything like that in terms of the cultural aspects of things. Anything that I get wrong, obviously is my own fault if I get anything wrong, but nobody really could tell me I've got anything wrong because again, my own language, my own culture, plus I'm writing about the future where it would have deviated a bit. So it's not going to be exactly the way it is right now. You know, some things are going to persist, but some things are not. And the language will drift a little bit. And the, the customs and the way people think about religion, all of those things are going to drift. And with time, I mean, because it's already happening now, and actually it comes to the crux of the whole book, about what the book is actually about. What you're seeing right now in places like Nigeria are like the videos, the music videos, the culture, the dressing and everything is really heavily influenced by America, you know, because of America's cultural imperialism, you know, to the rest of the world. You basically export your culture everywhere. So people take it on if you look at a music video produced in nigeria it looks very much like something produced in la and by that i i mean the symbolism the semiotics the idea for example of okay i'm singing a song and then i'm going to have a luxury car in the background and a scantily clad woman sitting on the car while i'm singing right? <laughs> concepts that were imported from ad agencies in america or hip-hop you, you see this quasi hip-hop look to it i don't necessarily have a problem with that it's just that sometimes it makes people not value their own cultures mm -hmm. and that's not good like not valuing your own culture is not a good thing if you look at the overriding theme of the book of the invasion itself what the invasion is talking about is the is the colonization of the mind all right is the taking over of people's thoughts which happens every day with the internet with films that we consume with the books that we consume all of that it transforms us slowly into something else in the novel you have the element that america's gone dark that like within the framework of the story in 2066 that somewhere along the lines were like oh it's aliens and america just closed up shop and like well that was enough for us and they're gone and they're like <laughs> off off the grid 
And this idea of like how the rest of the world thinks about that while you're trying to operate in this, the political climate, like, you know, internationally has completely changes with the basically, it's not just America. I mean, North America in general, like sort of like, you know, has put out the uh, close for a season, you know, sign. And I think also what I thought was interesting was that your story, like it's sort of the inciting incident of the Hyde Park landing of the of the alien takes place in 2012. So you've got like a almost uh, what do we call it? Like at least in, in, you know, reading it in 2018, it feels like it's like alternate history, almost, you know, alternate alternate near history. Is that a thing? Is that a genre? There's probably a genre for that. So like, how did you make that choice to (laughs) make it like that? Using 2012. So that has... 12, the number 12 has significance for Yoruba people, you see. Using that is a message to people who know what it means. It, what it means, there was, a, there was an election once on the 12th of June, and it was annulled, and it led to a really, you know, it led to a lot of unrest and the like, and it's something that is close to the heart of Yoruba people who are from Nigeria, because they're Yoruba people from other places, but Yoruba people from Nigeria really remember the 12th of June as not as a sacred date, but as a date where something really serious happened. And so that's that's actually the reason I use 2012. It wasn't, you know, it's not something to do historically about 2012 itself. It's about using the number 12 in there. And I wanted to use actually the 6th of June 2012, but I looked at the date and it didn't work. It didn't work because other things happened. So I just left it that way. You know, so that's that's the reason it's 2012. There's no there's no special significance to the date in world history. It's, it's like I wanted to use the number 12. Did you see the narrative with any of those other kinds of Easter eggy dates and times and stuff? I'm just curious. Not just dates and times. There are, there are, there are definite shout outs to books and films that I have liked in there. I mean, like, look, the book is, it's a love letter to all the science fiction, you know, and fantasy things I've loved. For example, one of one of the one of the first science fiction books I ever read was um was The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. For those who haven't read the book or even seen the film, The Andromeda Strain is probably about a bug. Uh, so a satellite is downed and it brings back exotic bacteria with it, and that bacteria starts killing people. So they have to determine the scientists have to determine if that bacteria is one an alien, two something from Russia. Maybe is it a, is it a weapon, a biological weapon? That was designed and so on. It was that. It was that kind of thing. So the place where they hid the, the because it had to be done in in secret. The, the research had to be done in secret. So the place where they did it was the Department of Agriculture. So that's why I also used the Department of Agriculture in my you know in my book as ah. the source for S five. That was the reason I used it. There was no other reason at all for it to be Department of Agriculture. But I'm using it directly to to say hello to the Andromeda strain for example. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So S45 is sort of like, which is the, the, the secretive agency and your is, is sort of backdoored as part of another fairly innocuous department so that you can, and yeah. And that reference is great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it could, it could have been any department, but I chose that deliberately just to say, yes, you know, I remember where I come from. There are also shout outs to, um, to Jack Kirby. So one, like when I was a child, Jack Kirby's art and his writing and all of that, also with his, you know, with Stan Lee and everything, was a very. I mean, I was really enthralled with it. I did lots of reading of comics and I did lots of drawing of, you know, I, I copied lots of his arts and everything. One of the characters there, which you will know when you've seen it, obviously you read, you've read it, so you know about it. One of the characters there is again a kind of shout out to Jack Kirby because. I don't know. Apparently, I wasn't interested in, in reading when I was a kid. So my mother made me, well, didn't make me, but took me out and I saw a Fantastic Four comic. And so um, I got interested. I wanted to read that because it was really colorful and powerful. And if you've ever seen Jack Kirby's art, it's energetic. It's, you know, it's really, he really was able to capture in two dimensions that flow of, you know, the movement, the energy, you know, it's fantastic, really. Um so because of Jack Kirby's art, I became interested in reading for its own for its own sake. You know, I wanted to pay some homage to that. So that is in there as well. You know, so and there's lot there's lots of other bits in there. I, I you know, but it, it was my love letter, basically. I love that. You know, you talked about like you were doing like flow charts, but a lot of this is in your head and, and you know, you're putting together this complex narrative. Now you've got the next novel coming out. It's, you know, Rosewater is the first book in a trilogy. Rosewater Insurrection comes out next year. Did your writing process evolve going into that? You know, does like writing a sequel to something is that does that bring you a whole bunch of new challenges after you've done all the world building in the first one? Well, not really, because it wasn't. So in my mind, it wasn't a sequel because it was I already knew 
I'd already worked out where it was going anyway. I mean, I've, all, all three books are written. The Rosewater Insurrection comes out early 2019, but the third one also comes out late 2019. So oh, wow. yeah. probably by this time next year, the third book should be out probably, but I don't have a date yet on that. So I didn't really have to change anything because I already knew, I knew the entire narrative anyway. What did change, I guess, was because after, after, after a book on the goes editing, not all the initial ideas will survive that process, the process of getting it through different editors. And so having done that, having had to make some changes, I had to then thread those changes back all the way through the rest of the books. And of course, for the other books, the focus is different. So for the first book, the focus was on Kara, and that was, that was right, that was correct. But I think we spent enough time in his head. You know, that, was, that was as much time as I'm willing to spend in the head of that person. You know, and like you said, he is a rather unpleasant character and you don't, he can't carry three books, at least in my opinion. You can't stay in that person's head for three books. It's not just that he's amoral. His thoughts, they're taxing on <laughs> any person. You know, you can't continue that for three books. I, I, at least I personally don't think so. And it's not what I intended to do. So the focus in book two shifts to a different aspect of the city. And the same thing happens in book three. You know, the focus shifts again. And all of the seeds, all of the seeds of those books are already in the book you've read, or they're already in Rosewater. So all of it is a logical progression of the events that you already have. You know, I didn't have to change my method. It's more like, I guess, again, it comes to editing again. I had to be more considerate of the reader. Like, you know, it's the same <laughs> type of thing I told you about. Oh, explain this. No, I don't want to explain it. Explain this. No, I'm not going to explain this. The reader can understand and so on. So I had to explain a few things that I didn't want to explain. But seeing the end result, I thought, actually, yeah, it actually is better if I explain it. You know, it's that kind of thing you have, you know, editors actually make your book better. For at least from my experience, they're a fan of the book. If they choose to work on a book, they're a fan of it. They like it. So what they want to do is to improve it. And I'm eternally grateful for that because I'm a very stubborn writer in terms of like, well, the reader knows, the reader understands and all that. But the way I see things is that the editor knows your audience better than you know the audience, right? And if you're writing, you know, if you're writing fiction, if you're writing commercial fiction, you know, you do have to think about the audience quite a bit. That is one of the things I've learned. But my method in particular didn't change. It was all in my head. If anything, I understood the world better. And I understood the world better because of questions the editor asked me. It made me understand. It crystallized my thoughts a lot better and everything. So, yeah, you know, it didn't change the method, but it did. Um, I do understand the world better than I did this time last year, for example. I would think that uh, working with an editor who asks good questions can be a really powerful tool uh, during that process because if they ask questions that you had not considered, the, you know, the writer brain will will find those answers for you, but that can often open doors to whole channels of, of your story that you hadn't even considered before. That's correct. Yes, I agree. And so, if, you know, because there, there was an original version, there's an Apex version and this version. There, there are significant differences between the two. And a lot of them are based on editing and based on questions that the editor asked me. Well, what about this? Why does this happen? And so on. So, yeah. When you were running into any problems putting the story together, I mean, beyond just like having the resource of having an editor, you know, where did you go for solutions? If you found yourself kind of, if you, if you backed yourself into a corner or maybe like had some kind of issue, I mean, if you had any of those, what were some of your coping mechanisms in order to figure out a backdoor out of a problem? What, you mean apart from alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> that does come up a lot with writers. Yeah. <laughs> it's strange. I don't, I actually don't get writer's block. Um, I, it just, it doesn't happen to me. I'm not saying when I say I don't get it, I'm not saying I don't understand it. I'm saying it doesn't happen to me. There are a lot of things churning pretty much all the time. And if I get to, like, if I'm writing and I get to a cul-de-sac or something like, like you thought of, what I just start doing is I start thinking of alternatives. Okay. Like, well, what, how did I get here? Basically, if I get to a point where I can no longer progress, it means that I've taken a wrong turn somewhere. So I just start backtracking. Okay. So at what point? did this become the inevitable end of this story? So I keep backtracking by scene, by scene, by scene, until I realize the root of the block. Because if, if what happens when you're writing is, especially if you're, you know, if you're not someone who plots heavily, and I don't plot heavily before I go for the first draft, you keep going, you keep going, you try to, you have a character. What I do is I have a character. I, I make sure I have a character and then I have a scenario. Then I throw the character into the scenario and I just allow the person to, take me along the story. I may have a few waypoints, 
you know, I'm talking, I'm talking game lingo there. <laughs> but um, I have a few waypoints that I know about and I know how the story ends. But basically, I set the character free and I start going. So if I get to a point where, hang on, I can't move from this point, I then backtrack scene by scene because there is a logical thread that runs through. There's a reason we got to that point. So I then go back. What do I need to change? And then I, it's like that. Um, those choose your own adventure books. There is a reason some of them stop. So I pull myself back and then realize, okay, from this point, what I need to change is this. And then it flows normally again. So I kind of go that way. There are always different pathways in the books that I write. There are different endings that I considered. If one doesn't work, I try the next one. If it doesn't work, I try the next one and so on. And then I compare the two and I, I, I ask myself which of those gives the message that I wanted to give. That's, that's how it works. So that's what, that's what I do. The other thing I do is if I can't think of a solution, I literally just stop and I do something completely different that uses a completely different parts of my brain. So I might go and paint or I might exercise or do something that doesn't involve fiction at all. So I won't read fiction. I won't write fiction. I won't do anything like that. I'll do something visual or something physical while my subconscious works on it. And invariably, when I get back to sit down, the answer will be there. Invariably. It, sometimes it takes a long time, but all I have to do is to make sure I don't do anything fiction related before I find the solution. So usually, sometimes it might take a few days, which is fine. But by the time I get to the end of those few days, I know what the answer should be. And sometimes the answer that I know is mediocre. It's not as powerful as I might want. But by the time I get to the end of the narrative, I would have thought of something more powerful so I can come back and revise it to make it better. Yeah, I think when you're when you're drafting something, allow yourself to be mediocre. It doesn't matter. In fact, allow yourself to stick. It doesn't actually matter if it's bad when you do the first draft. You can then leisurely come back and go through each thing and say, well, this is really horrible. Did I really write this? You know, and then just cross <laughs> it out and you know, come back with a critical mind and look at it and say, you know, tell yourself, okay, this is rubbish. How can I make this better? That, that's, that's what I do. Well, you can only improve something if there's already something there, right? Exactly. It has to exist to be improved. Yeah. I, I love, I don't remember who said it, but the, uh, a line I've always liked is give yourself permission to suck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because once you actually put something down, you can refine it. You can polish it or, or remove it, or at the very least cross it off. I think sometimes just getting it out of your head, even if it's a bad idea, once it's written down, you're like, oh, okay, I don't have to obsess over that idea anymore. It's, it's, it's completed. It's here. And I can shuffle it away if it doesn't work. I think what happens is I think the way we're trained in school is that we need to sit down and write it. And then it goes to the teacher who marks it. So a lot of us leave school thinking whenever we do any kind of writing, it has to be done you know, in real time. So it has to either be good or bad in real time. And then it becomes whatever it is. You know, the best discovery that you find is that actually you can move things around quite a bit. You can do what you like and just write that initial thing and then go from there. You know, keep, you can keep refining it as long as you like. Although you do have to tell yourself, hang on, I am over revising this. I, it's time to stop. Yeah. There's, there is a point where it has to be done. I've, I've heard said, uh, you know, done is better than right. Um, you know, you want it to be as good as you can get it. But at the same time, you, you know, you do have to give up the thing eventually and be like this, this is complete. It may not be perfect because nothing is, but it's complete. But it's complete. Yes. So you mentioned uh, the, the influence of things that you grew up with and, and, uh, and how they affect you. I appreciate you, you know, mentioned the Kirby thing. Like I've got my little like wall of nerd behind me and there's a dark side of apocalypse hiding over there. What other media today is, is feeling your writer brain? What stuff um, do you turn to when you, when you give yourself a free minute, you know, TV, film, books, games, what, what's out there? Um, I think my gaming years are done, but I still kind of go back and play. So my, my, I can date myself by saying that my go-to games are, you know, Counter-Strike, Half-Life, and Unreal Tournament. <laughs> you know, I know, that, I, I know that dates me, but I still haven't recovered from seeing Doom. Like, I don't know if you remember that era, but when Doom came out, oh, it I was do. completely different from anything, all right? And I just, you know, just looking at those, you know, like going down those corridors and turning and, and, and everything was, it was, it was still amazing to me. And I... I go as far back as the arcade. Like, you know, having consoles or video games in in the home was was a novelty, was a new thing for us, and it was a lot cheaper than what we used to spend when we used to go to arcades. I can't, I don't have the time to play games anymore. But when I take breaks, I still play. I still play. You know, some of the single player Unreal Tournament. I still sometimes go on the trip with with the original Half Life. I still do that just to remind myself. Um, but I don't have the time, and I don't have the the finger. It's not the dexterity, but if you use your fingers for typing most of the time and then you use your fingers for gaming, you start to get repetitive stress injuries. So 
I, I have come to the conclusion that I am too old now. Not because my brain isn't nimble, but my fingers are not nimble enough to do that. So um, I'm not playing any reason. Actually, no, I, I, I lie. I played um, Bioshock. I really like Bioshock. I played that quite a lot, um, at least until until last year. So I like I like Bioshock. I really did. I also liked Borderlands. I played Borderlands a bit, but other than other than that, I don't I don't really play games regularly. I, I don't do that a lot anymore. Um, but with TV, I don't watch regular TV. I because I, I really like to control my time. So I like Netflix for that reason that you can control when you watch whatever it is you watch. Yeah. Um, you know, so most recently I, I enjoyed um, season three of Daredevil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought that season was a return to form. I don't think season two was as powerful as it could have been. So season three was a return to form. I, I pretty much I pretty much enjoyed every single episode of, of season three of Daredevil. Um, I enjoyed The Haunting of Hill House. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. There's a French film called Raw that I really enjoyed. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, you can look it up and you can thank me later when you're throwing off your food. <laughs> 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 but it's really powerful. I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked It Follows. I enjoyed Get Out. A Get Out's great, um, yeah. Ragnar- yeah, Thor Ragnarok. I enjoyed Thor Ragnarok. You're a Kirby immensely. fan. Yeah, so you... Kirby fan, yes. um, but not only am I a Kirby fan, but I'm also a fan of um, Jason Aaron, who wrote the more recent... Um, for comics yeah. i know he's doing an excellent he's doing an excellent job on that and in fact i'll say here i wrote my first letter to a comics book page in probably about 20 years but i wrote it to one of jason aaron's um to to the unworthy thor oh Where wow published. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah yeah the first one it was last year it was the first time i wrote i felt strongly enough about a comic that i actually wrote a letter and it was on the letters page. So like, oh, like, like young me would really be, you know, would be happy with myself for doing that. But I think that the the Thor comics that Jason Aaron is currently writing are some of the best, one best Thor narratives, but two best superhero narratives that I've read in a very long time. And I have been reading comics for a very, very long time. You know, so kudos to that guy. I don't know what he's channeling, but he's doing it right. Yeah. You know, and what I found in, the, in uh, Thor Ragnarok is that they are taking some of the best parts of his run. And, they, you know, down to his haircut, you know, because people often, you know, like what I found is people who were not fans of the comics, when they saw that they cut his hair, they were like, well, why did they cut his hair and everything? And I'm like, well, because he's unworthy. He's the unworthy Thor. Yeah. And it has echoes of Samson, you know, like, look, you're not worthy. We're taking your power away. You can't hold your hammer. Your hammer's gone and we're cutting your hair. Yeah. But it, you need to think about the echoes of the thing. It echoes, you know, it, this is deep mythology. It's really, it's really great. You know, so Thor Ragnarok and obviously like, Obviously, the Thor comics, obviously. Um, Saga, the Saga comics, I really, I'm really enjoying those. So good, yeah. That's good. I mean, and we, we have that at the same time that we have Monstress. I don't know if you've read Monstress. Not um, yet, not yet, yeah. You really should. You really should. It is, I can't believe that we have Monstress at the same time that we have Saga. Like, it's like we have, like, we have these two excellent comics happening at the same time. Like, even though we've got lots of derivative comics happening right now, but we also have, you know, we're in some kind of golden age as well. We've got, okay, sorry, for the uninitiated, I'm saying golden age as a descriptor, but I'm not using the comics golden yeah. age because um, golden age means a different thing to comic fans. Like, so yeah. I'm not used, So to the comic fans, I am not saying the golden age or the silver age. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we have good comics right now. You're essentially using it the same way we say the golden age of television, like the like now that we're in the age of, of really great scripted narrative, long form TV. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't want my people to think that all of a sudden I've forgotten what the golden <laughs> age is, you know. And that was that was me. My like one little twitch in my brain, like that's not it. I'm like, but I'm not pedantic <laughs> about that way. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. This is the thing about comic fans. You know, you know the 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 terms matter. The terms yes. you use they matter a lot, and they can help. You know. It's amazing how how tribal comics can be, and it can backfire sometimes. But there you go. That's there's a book called Jade City by Fonda Lee. I, oh, gosh, I adore Fonda. She's she's great. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. Have you read Jade City? I, you know, okay. So this is this is really bad. Like, I have Jade City. I haven't gotten to it yet because I like I'm. I'll be doing interviews with Fonda. I I think it, through like through the publicist um, early next year when the, when the sequel comes out. So I'm going to be reading ahead of that. I know Fonda because I did panels with her at a convention uh, earlier this year, and that's how I first met her. Um, and she was recommended through a publicist, and she's just one of the smartest, most articulate fascinating thinkers that i've i've had the, the 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 joy of spending time on stage with and i just i really really enjoy her as a person bump whatever it is you're reading and read jade city all right just you know when you finish reading when you get to the end of the book tell the book that i sent you <laughs> 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 it's a great book you should read that you should you should bump everything else if you have the book in your house right now or on your on your reader then that you really should be reading it right now um, it's, it's, it, it, it takes all the boxes basically. And also just won a big award. Uh, I think just a few nights ago or maybe in the last it week. Did. British fantasy award. I think, it, I think it won the British fantasy award and it deserves to do that. It's a really great book. It, it, it definitely deserves to do that. Um, I'm also reading a lot of Betty Campbell's old comics. You know, oh yeah. Is- yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, ca- I'm you know, I'm kind of currently going i'm doing a personal um retrospective of eddie campbell so i've I just reread from hell and i'm kind of working my way through his own creator own stuff you know so alec and um and Bacchus, you know and i'm really loving it I, and I, I i now realize why i loved it at the time it came out and everything so um so i'm going through that i re- really really liking that that's what i'm looking forward to is the um the new uh, wizard of earth sea you know the hardback, the illustrated one with Charles Vess. I am really looking forward to um, to getting into that. Um, it's going. To, I, I I have already bought it. I I prefer. See, this is the thing that happens to me sometimes. I prefer the American version to the British version. You know, so I've bought the American version, and it's with a friend who's going to send it to me. In that sense, I, I like the art. I like the cover art of the American version better than the British version. I often have times have the the other side around where like I will see the UK version uh, show up in somebody's feed, and I'll be like, "Wait, that that cover's so great! Why don't I have that cover?" Uh, <laughs> it's just like, "What? Why are you withholding that from us over here?" We know. Why should we not have that? Yeah. You know? um, yeah. You know. So that's that's where I am. Well, that uh, all of that is awesome. Uh, Rosewater Insurrection uh, will be coming out in early of 2019. Rose, Rosewater is available now, has been win, winning awards and getting you a, a pretty fair amount of acclaim in the in the publishing world as well. You've got the the third part of that trilogy coming out, hopefully late 2019. Where should people be following you to keep up with your stuff, to find your other writing, um, and uh, just to get the whole experience with you? Where do they find you? The best place to find me is on Twitter. I... I... I tweet fairly regularly, probably like at least once or twice a day. Um, today I tweeted about Yuri Geller. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, something actually what triggered it, some of your questions actually triggered that because you had asked me, um, you know, when you sent me the questions, you talked about, okay, well, where did the idea come from? So I said, so I, I started remembering the, you know, the old CIA files and everything. And then I remembered that in 1997, a, a football team called Exeter City, all right, got Yuri Geller to come and psychically make them win a match against their opponents, which was Chester. Um, and he went, <laughs> sprinkled, he sprinkled special crystals around the goalposts and everything like that. They lost 5 <laughs> 1. <laughs> oh, but did anybody's spoons get bent? I mean, really? Yeah. Well, you know, they did. Obviously, Exeter didn't have enough spoons. So. Yeah. That. <laughs> I always think of uh, Yuri Geller because, like, I was one of those kids that got obsessed with, like, those, like, time life mysteries of the unknown books, you know, when I was a kid. 40 and Times. Did you read 40 and Times? Uh, I did a little bit, of, you know, because I was one of those, like, kids who got really obsessed with all the supernatural stuff. And, you know, yes. when the X-Files came along, there were times where, like, I would say what Mulder was going to say ahead of what he would explain exactly. something. And my friends yeah. would turn and look at me like, what the hell? And I'd be like, I I read the same books. Yeah, it's Chris Carter. It's, you you know Chris Carter is one of us. That's you know that's what it is. It's true because he's read the same books. He's obsessed about the same conspiracy theories. He's done the whole thing of looking at that photograph of Bigfoot. You know when I when I saw X Files, I knew that this guy had had the same arguments that I had had. I yeah. knew it. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I felt like I was like, oh, I'm not the only person who has uh, a file drawer full of printouts of photocopies and, and internet files and stuff of weird supernatural things that I found on forums and stuff way before, you know, way before we had like, you know, really fast internet and stuff, you know, that it like, yeah. I was like, I have to hold on to this because this may not exist forever. <laughs> yes, it could disappear. And a lot of things have gone, you know, I remember because I, I had a similar thing, but what I had is I had a document, I had a Word document with the URLs in. And so from time to time, I go back and check and I realize that some of these websites don't exist anymore. Right. And I can't even find information anywhere. You know, so I, I pretty much had that thing where there was that function. You also had that function in um in web in um web browsers back then. You could do it in Netscape. Um, haha, Netscape. I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, where you could tell it to download the web pages in the background while you're surfing and everything. And of course, they're using a 56-bit modem, so it, everything is as slow as hell. But at least you could check those things offline and read them and, and make notes from them. Yeah, and one page was one HTML page. It was not a, a dozen different things loading into one yeah, or 350 style sheets and whatnot. Yeah, so. Exactly. It was just, and you could, you, could, you could just look at the HTML code and you could actually read everything just from the code itself, which was, which was fine. You know, um, so, yeah, it's, you know, like you, when I, you know, X-Files, one of the big things for me about X-Files is that, yes, this is talking about stuff that I know. I, <laughs> I, I, lo I love it, like, when you can read something and you can get that feeling of, like, oh, I feel that there's, there, there's that, um, that, that creepy kid DNA somewhere in there that's yeah, shared that's be between all of us. So maybe we're all connected by those same fibers. Who knows? We are definitely. Yeah. Well, this has been excellent. Thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. I hope everybody goes out and reads Rosewater because it really was a, a fascinating read. And I'm so uh, looking forward to Insurrection uh, and seeing where it all goes uh, goes next. Thank you so much. Yeah. And come and find me on Twitter. I will always answer your questions on Twitter. All right. Thanks for having me here. Fictitious is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Buskey, and co-produced by Wendy Buskey. If you've got a few minutes to spare and would like to help out the show, here are a couple of ways to spread the word about Fictitious. One, you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And two, you can share a link to the show on Twitter, Facebook, or wherever you do your social networking thing. I can't stress enough how much those simple actions will help to spread the word about the show, which helps us grow and bring you more awesome author guests. And it also helps those writers reach new audiences. You can follow Fictitious on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all under the handle FictitiousPod. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. And you can find all of our episodes plus book reviews at FictitiousPodcast.com. Thanks for listening. More author conversations coming your way very soon. 